this message today, uh, a continuation of our There's a Dragon in Night, my Nativity series, uh, For They Are Virgins. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, and I think even today, many people tell children this, you can be anything you want to be. And uh, I've I, I found in my own life experience that there's a problem with that promise. You can be anything you want to be because uh, I have always wanted to be the center for an NBA basketball team. Uh, if you don't know basketball very well, the center is the tall guy, okay? The guy that's standing to his left is six foot one. So he's an inch or more, I've shrunk in recent years, taller than me. So if somebody says to you, says to me, you can be anything you want, I have to say, no, I can't, because I want to be the center of an NBA basketball team, but I cannot be Rudy Gobert, because I can't be seven foot one. Not only that, Rudy Gobert has a few other skills that I don't think I could ever develop, even if I were seven foot one. Um, Donovan Mitchell, at six foot one, also has skills I will never have. And I have something that neither one of these guys have that's really my excuse for why I'm not an NBA basketball player, and that is I have a partial knee replacement and arthritis in my knees. And I'm not as young as I used to be. And so when somebody says that you can be anything you want, sometimes the answer is, mm, no, I can't. But we can also discover that we can be what we are made to be, and we can enjoy and, and recognize what we may want to be. The problem is with our verse today, there's also something that I cannot be, and I'm guessing maybe many of you here today cannot be either, and that is part of this 144,000 because there are certain requirements to the 144,000 that, that kind of set us back a little bit. And the one we're going to look at today is this particular identity of the 144,000 that says they are virgins. They're virgins. This idea as presented in this message leaves us with this Wondering, okay, so how does one become part of one with the 144,000 if they have pre existing conditions that disqualify them? Well, it really is kind of one of those issues of the impossibility of being a part of this remnant. But, but I think to really understand this verse and to explore it, we need to explore some of the Old Testament context of Revelation to, to see what's going on in this verse. You see, Jerusalem was under siege in the Old Testament story that I'm going to take you to here in a minute. Jerusalem was under siege by King Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. And Sennacherib had, had the city of Jerusalem essentially surrounded. And he began to uh, threaten the city. Hezekiah was the king of Israel at the time, king of Judah at the time, and, and Hezekiah had an army that is described in Scripture as being like a woman that is in labor and the child is about to be delivered, but she is so exhausted she does not have the energy to make that last push. And that's the identity of Hezekiah's army as Sennacherib has the city surrounded. And so Sennacherib begins to challenge them with his boastful threats. He, he says things like, do you trust Egypt? Is Egypt going to come and save you? I don't think so. Counting on Egypt to come and save you would be like using a reed for a walking stick. It's just going to shatter in your hands. Egypt isn't going to come save you. And if you think your Lord God is going to come and save you, all the gods of all the other nations that I've ever gone up against have not been able to win a battle against me. There's no way your God can save you either. Do you think that you can trust this, Lord? 
when in fact you've torn down all the high places that ever made anybody powerful. The only place that you have an altar and the only place that you worship is in Jerusalem. So I think you just need to stop listening to your King Hezekiah and you need to come out to me and you need to surrender. I know that behind all those the, the, the city walls, you might have a vine and you might have a fig tree and you've got a cistern to drink from and you think you've really got it made inside of that city. But if you come out to me and you surrender to me, I'll give you not a vine, but I'll give you vineyards. I'll not give you one fig tree, I'll give you fields. And I'll give you bread, and I'll give you wine, and I'll give you food, and you will li come and live in a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Olive groves, everything you could possibly enjoy. Why lose your lives for a God who Hezekiah says will save you when you can give your lives to me and have everything you need? Hezekiah hears these boasts of Sennacherib. He hears his boasting. He hears, hears this message that's being shared out. And he, he tears his clothes and he prays to the Lord for deliverance. And the Lord answers. The Lord answers him through Isaiah the prophet. And this is our message that Isaiah shares. 2 Kings 19, 20 through 21. Then Isaiah the son of Amoz sent to King Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your prayers to me about Sirachabib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. You ready for the message? By the way, you guys still awake, right? Okay, just want to make sure. It's a little quiet out there today. All right, I'm missing some babies or something. We need some children to make some noise. All right. This is the message. She despises you. She scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. This is God's message to Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is his message. You think this girl is going to give herself to you? You think the... the the virgin daughter of Zion is going to give up on, on being within the city walls of Jerusalem, faithfully worshiping and following her God. She despises you, Sennacherib. She scorns you. She's wagging her head behind you. She's saying, no way am I going to come out of the city and trust myself to you. Now, one of the things that we notice here is that faithfulness is, is the context of this passage. And Israel, in a faithful relationship with God, is described as this virgin daughter of Zion. She's the faithful bride of God. And so when, when any other suitor would come along and try to lure her out of the city, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair, is kind of Sennacherib's approach. She despises him. She scorns him. Shakes her head no. And there's no way I'm going with you. Faithfulness to God means rejecting the earthly kingdoms in exchange for, uh, for embracing the reign and the rule of God. And that's what we see here in this virgin daughter of Zion. She despises these offers. She says no. She looks forward to a city whose builder and maker is God. And that's the city that she now dwells in as this daughter of Zion. Surrounded by the Assyrian king or not, she knows she's in the right place. And she knows she's with the right king. And it all goes well. You know, it, the, their situation seems hopeless. But the message that is also given by Isaiah the prophet is that Sennacherib is not going to win this battle. He's not going to win this war. Turns out that the angel armies of the Lord come and they destroy Sennacherib's army. Sennacherib runs off and as prophesied by Isaiah, Sennacherib is killed and slaughtered by his own sons so that they can have the throne. Sennacherib never takes the city. Hezekiah 
feels pretty good about that. He feels very secure in the protection that God has given him. And so Hezekiah decides that, that he's going to make friends with some of the nations around him. And one of the nations he, he decides he wants to make friends with is, is Babylon. And so he invites representatives from Babylon to come and he, he shows them his treasure. And they see his treasure. We had a whole sermon about this a while back. He shows them his treasure and he thinks that showing him them his treasure is, is how he's going to show them how much the Lord is, how powerful the Lord is, and how much the Lord has blessed him. And he thinks that, that there, now they're, these guys are going to be really impressed by me. And instead, what Babylon does is Babylon leaves, and Babylon puts up a, an attack plan. <laughs> we've got to take Hezekiah, and we've got to take his kingdom because we want to take his wealth. And it doesn't take very long before Babylon ends up attacking. The prophet Isaiah comes to Hezekiah with a new message. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and, and that which your fathers have stored up until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. So in exile... As Israel has been taken off into captivity in Babylon, and this prophecy is actually fulfilled, Jeremiah takes up an, a lament for Israel, and this is what Jeremiah has to say in Lamentations. How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. What can I say for you? To what... Uh, Sorry, to what compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken you to that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is vast as the sea, and who can heal you? Now here's what I find fascinating about the story. We read one story where Israel, or sorry, Judah is in, in close relationship with God. And is inside the city walls, shaking her head to the king of Assyria and saying, no way, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And later on we find a story where she doesn't say no, <laughs> essentially, to Babylon. She ends up embracing that kingdom and getting that kingdom. And even in exile, even in Babylon, through Jeremiah the prophet, she is still called the virgin daughter of Zion. In good relationship with God, out of good relationship with God, she's still seen, not from her own perspective, but she's seen from the perspective of God. She's the virgin daughter of Zion, whether she's in freedom or whether she's in Babylon. She's still his virgin daughter. What he's asking, though, is your ruin is as vast as the sea. Who can heal you? She never stops being his daughter. And she never stops being pure, even in his eyes, especially in his eyes. Even when Israel is unfaithful, God is faithful. Even when she is chased off after Babylon, God promises the hope of healing. This healing, this thing that has taken place in this context is, is also the experience of the disciples of Jesus and the early apostles. Consistently, they refer to the church as a pure virgin. I feel a divine jealousy for you, says the Apostle Paul. He says, I hope you'll put up with a little foolishness of mine, but I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The Apostle Paul seems to warn the people that he's leading that, that my goal is to make you prepared to be the bride of Christ. But I'm afraid you're going to leave that devotion. I'm, I'm afraid you're going to lose your heart for being with him. And then he goes on to expand it a little bit. He says, for, for if someone, try again, for if someone comes along proclaiming another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you received 
a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. See, what Paul's trying to point out with the people is he's trying to say, look, there are three things that can really trip you up when it comes to being the faithful bride of Christ. First of all, another Christ, (laughs) another Jesus. That's something that can trip you up. That's something that can cause a problem. If, if, If suddenly someone else comes into your life as your Savior, you run the risk of losing the one that is your husband. Or a different spirit, a different source of conviction, a different source of of compulsion, if you will, a different source of, of prompting to do the right thing. And lastly, also part of his message, a different gospel from the one that you have accepted. Now, what I love about this is is we have this description, this context of another Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. And it's very natural for us, I think, to think, well, when he's talking about a different gospel, he's talking about righteousness by works instead of righteousness by faith. That must be what he means by a different gospel. And I don't think it's that he doesn't mean that. I think it's that gospel, euangelion, has a very distinct meaning among these disciples and among these apostles that I find as a preacher I I need to constantly kind of help people unlearn their definition of gospel. Because it seems like most of the time when we talk about gospel, most people think it means Jesus died for your sins in, in order for you to go to heaven. So if you accept Jesus as your Savior, if you believe in Jesus, then you get to go to heaven someday. And we think that's the gospel. And it's not that that's not the gospel. That is incredibly good news, and that's what euangelion, gospel in English, means. The problem is we have lost the kingdom context of the word gospel. And so you've probably heard me explain this before, and I'm going to explain it again, because it just seems like we just need to unlearn our idea of gospel. And the idea of euangelion in the first century world is that long before Jesus or John the baptizer or anybody else preached good news out on the street, people in the first century world under Roman occupation were used to somebody coming into town, a herald sent from Rome coming into town and saying, Euangelion, good news. We have a new king. His name is Caesar Augustus. And he is king and lord and even God over you. And you owe him your allegiance. You owe him your taxes. And if you're really smart, you'll also owe him your worship. This is long before John the baptizer. This is long before Jesus. And what I love is that when God decides to send his son into the world, God hijacks a political term. And he sends John the baptizer out there saying, good news, there's a new king. Now you need to understand, right, John starts preaching that while there is a Caesar in power and a Herod in power as well. And Pharisees and scribes, synagogue rulers in power. There's all kinds of people who would claim lordship over the masses. And John the baptizer is sent by God into the world to say, good news, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So forget about Caesar, forget about Herod, forget about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law, the synagogue rulers. God is taking his throne. John the baptizer preaches it. Jesus preaches it. Jesus then sends his disciples out to preach it. The kingdom of heaven, the reign and the rule of heaven is at hand. It's within reach. It's here now. And it's all there in the person of Jesus. So to accept a different Jesus 
isn't just to accept a different message about how you will go to heaven someday. To accept a different Jesus is to accept a different king. To give your worship and your allegiance. Everything you are to someone other than Jesus. To receive a different spirit is to receive some counterfeit spirit. Instead of being guided conscientiously by the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life, putting the actual love of Christ into you to will and to do His good pleasure, you simply do what you have to do because if you don't do what you have to do, the ruling powers will force you to. Different gospel. Certainly something else other than God will save us. Maybe science will. Maybe just better political strategies will. Maybe the next best leader will. Be the king, be the ruler, be the person in power and authority over us that will give us what we want. Paul says, that's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that you're going to settle for something less than what is supreme. I'm afraid you're going to settle for something less than Jesus. It seems like you put up with it readily enough. It seems to be the path of least resistance, and I'm worried about that. Back to our verse in Revelation. As we see this description of this bride of Christ, one of the things that we see about this bride of Christ is that they are blameless. Again, we look at that and we say, well, I guess that's not me. I guess I'm not blameless. But I would remind you that as we study Scripture, we find all kinds of different blameless people. We find Abraham blameless in the eyes of the Lord. Sinless? No. Blameless? Yes. We're even told about Abraham. He's blameless by faith. That's how he's blameless. Job? A righteous and devout man, blameless before the Lord. Sinless? No. Blameless? Yes. The great thing about the remnant is it tells us how they become blameless. It tells us why they are blameless. These have been redeemed. They've been purchased. They've been won by the blood of Christ. That's why they're blameless. Not only that, not only have they been redeemed, they are first fruits for God and for the Lamb. And I want to notice, point something out for you. I, I think we're fortunate because we live far enough south here in Salt Lake City that maybe we can understand this notion of being of first fruits. Anybody have the trees in your yard that bear some edible fruit? Come on, where's Jason? I know you do. Don't lie. First fruits. My mom used to always say about living in northern Wyoming, she'd say, Wyoming is fruitless. <laughs> it's fruitless living in Wyoming. <laughs> I was very grateful when we got our house here in Salt Lake area that the neighbor had a whole orchard of nectarines, and apricots, and fruit, peaches, and pears, apples. That's pretty awesome when you move from Montana. First fruits. And there's one thing that everybody knows who has ever tended a fruit tree, and that is that if that tree bears fruit, it's not your fault. <laughs> you don't get any credit for that. I mean, sure, I know. I lived in Yakima, Washington. My first house was in the middle of an orchard. We moved there in December, and, and there were all these trees, mystery trees, because I had no idea what was going to grow on them until springtime came, and different colors of blossoms came on, and different leaves came on, and eventually different fruit. And I learned a fair amount about the orchard life. But... And I, and I know that there are good orchardists that do great work. My head elder in Yakima, Washington, is a very gifted orchardist. I first heard about Fuji apples and Honeycrisp apples from him when he bought his trees. Not that he was the first, but it was the first time I heard about it. And one of the things that I know is 
to have fruit on those trees, especially here in Utah, is a miracle, right? Because the blossoms come on and then you check the weather forecast and there are no bees flying around and it's going to frost tonight. And some years you get them and some years you don't. But when you get them, you know it's a miracle. And you know it's no matter what, you can't make a tree. God makes trees. And you can't make trees bear fruit. God makes trees bear fruit. That's one of the things that you know. And so they are blameless because they've been redeemed. And because they've been redeemed, they bear fruit. And they don't bear fruit because they somehow they pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and figured out a way to be good. They bear fruit because they're attached to the true vine. And apart from him, they can do nothing. Because they have been redeemed, and because they've been redeemed, they bear fruit. And part of the fruit that they bear is that no lie is found in their mouth. They speak truth in a world that is dishonest. And a lot of times when we come to this part of this idea, we think, yeah, that's right, it's the Christian's job to stand out there and tell all those sinners that they're sinners. And I really think that when it comes to speaking the truth, one of the things that God wants us to do is just be honest about ourselves. Never mind telling everybody else that they're sinners. What about you? What about me? I think we've got enough to worry about right there. No lie was found in their mouths. And I wonder as we think about even church life, are we honest with each other? Do we tell each other the truth or do we just kind of show up and, and just kind of uh, you know, put on a facade and say, yeah, I'm good. Look at me, I'm a good Christian. And is there ever a moment of transparency where we say, no, I'm not. <laughs> Somehow God sees me as blameless, and, and that's because I've been redeemed, and, and there's certainly some fruit that he's producing, but I'm not perfect. I'm not sinless. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Maybe that's what it means when it says no lie was found in their mouths. They were honest about themselves, they were honest with each other, they weren't afraid to speak the truth. I love the fact that in this context, that same Apostle Paul who, who goes to his church and says, I really want you to be a pure virgin bride of Christ, he also goes to the church and I'm just sharing one with you today because I wanted to somehow try to figure out how to keep this sermon under 30 minutes, and it's 2751 right now. So I'm going to end with this verse. It's just one, but if you search Paul's writings, you'll find all kinds of them, and I, I picked this one because I think it's, it's, a, it's a benediction. It's a blessing. It's something I would just want to say to you. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is our desire to be seen and known by you as you see us and as you know us. Lord, we see ourselves, if we're honest, if truth is found in our mouths, we see ourselves as sinful and broken and desperately in need of a Savior. But Lord, when you see us, you don't see us, you see your Son. And you see sinlessness, and you see blamelessness, and you see everything. Everything that qualifies us to be your people. Lord, as we receive that, as we see that identity in you, we ask, Father, that it would become 
the identity we embrace, the reality we know you speak is true. And may that be the gift that we take and we bring and we live in this world, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.